Dr. Linda Spilker, welcome to the program. Thank you very much, John. It's a pleasure to be here. Now, Doctor, you have been involved with planetary science for many years, and myself as a, as a space enthusiast have as well since the 1980s with Voyager. And one thing that stuck in my memory was the circumstances around the pass of Neptune and the surprises of Neptune and seeing that world back in 1989 for the first time, which before then, Neptune had just been this dot in a telescope can't even see it with the naked eye, but there it was, you know, this beautiful blue world with clouds and a spot somewhat similar to Jupiter. And it really captivated my then teenage imagination. What was that like being a scientist at that time? What was that like? And what is it like now still working with both of the Voyager spacecraft? Well, that Neptune flyby was so amazing. It was the first time a spacecraft, Voyager 2, had flown by Neptune. And for me, as a ring scientist, I was so fascinated by Neptune's rings because they were arcs of material. They were not the complete rings that we saw at Saturn and at Uranus. And so to try and understand those very puzzling arcs was truly amazing. And then to get a close-up view of Neptune's large moon Triton and to see this surface kind of looking part of it look like cantaloupe terrain and actually seeing tiny geysers going off at the south pole of Triton and just the amazement and so many new discoveries that came not just of the planet but of the rings and the moons in that system as well and and that was true for me for all of the planetary flybys I had the rare privilege to be part of the the Jupiter Saturn Uranus and Neptune flybys and such incredible science, in a sense, rewriting the textbooks that we had at that time about what we knew about the planets and their moons and their rings. And and today is no less exciting. It isn't as colorful and visual as what we had with the planetary flybys, but we're in a totally new place in interstellar space. And that's something Voyager's good at, making discoveries and going to new places. So after flying across the solar system, crossing a boundary called the heliopause, the boundary between the sun's influence and interstellar space. We've been flying now with Voyager 1 for more than a decade, studying what it's like in that space between the stars, looking at the, the particles and the fields and, and making measurements to help us better understand and put in context our own solar system and the stars in our galaxy. The heliopause is an interesting word. What exactly is the heliopause and why do we use that as a demarcation line of the end of the sun's influence in, 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 in a certain context anyway? Right, right. It's not so much the end of the sun's influence, but it's just a boundary where the solar wind has reached out far enough. There's this wind that comes from the sun and it's now balanced by the interstellar wind. And that balance point creates a boundary that we call the heliopause. The heliopause isn't a static boundary. It actually moves in and out because the solar wind varies as the solar cycle varies. So that wind from the sun varies, pushing the boundary in and out just a little bit. And that interstellar wind is generated from supernova explosions, from stars as they've aged and exploded and have blown out these large bubbles of gas. So in a sense, our heliopause is nested between these bubbles created by these supernova explosions and, and perhaps even space in between those as well. And so it's sort of like a sail and it's sometimes it billows, sometimes it doesn't, and sometimes there's calms. And so with the Voyager spacecraft, at least Voyager 1, we see sometimes you see the heliopause, sometimes you don't as it moves in and out. Is that a good characterization? Yeah, the, the heliopause uh, moves just a small amount. The Voyagers now are well past it. Uh, many, in fact, Voyager 1 is at 160 astronomical units away using the Sun-Earth distance as 1 AU. So it's quite far away. We, we didn't see necessarily multiple crossings of the heliopause as we went across it. it. It moves very slowly because the solar cycle has a very slow variation as well. There's still events, we call them shocks or pressure fronts, events 
that come out from the sun. Maybe you have a coronal mass ejection, some large event that just puts out a tremendous amount of particles and energy, and that can actually go through the heliopause and make itself felt out in interstellar space. And so along the way, Voyager has witnessed these shocks and and pressure fronts uh, as we go, and we're wondering where does that moment occur where we no longer see that this influence from the sun, and it, it may go out uh, quite some distance, actually.